this evening's seminar. So my name is Manuel Ali and I'm a member of the Center for Gender Studies here at SOAS. It's my uh, great pleasure to uh, chair this evening's talk. I should say that when I first met uh, Alyosha in July 2014, which now, as we both agreed, seems to be a life a little long away, it's uh, so many things have happened since then. She was interviewing for a post of Oscar to replace the teaching of our colleague Ruba Saleh. And uh, after five minutes, I knew that Alyosha was very special and precious, and I'm um, so glad that she's <laughs> Alyosha is, of course, not only a senior teaching fellow with us, and she's been um, convening gender migration and diasporas last term and the year before, and uh, this term she's convening queer politics, but Alyosha is, of course, also uh, the LSD fellow in transnational gender studies, and uh, this is also great because um, we feel that she's a great bridge between the Gender Institute at LSD and I see we have some uh, <laughs> members of the audience who are representing the Gender Institute and the Center for Gender Studies. And I think as part of our feminist work of trying to do things differently, there's always this competition between SOAS and LSE. But I think where Gender Studies is concerned, we are showing that we can do things differently. So, um, uh, Alyosha's work connects trans and queer feminist approaches with transnational feminism and post-colonial studies. Her, uh, their main research interest lies in analyzing knowledge productions on migrations, diasporas, and borders, uh, particularly in relations to critiques of Eurocentrism and to processes of gendering and racialization. And uh, of course, today's uh, lecture will be uh, about the distinction, the analytical, political, and theoretical distinction between racism and migratism, which has been really at the core of uh, Alyosha's work. In the past, they have worked as an assistant researcher at the Center for Transdisciplinary Gender Studies at the Humboldt University in Berlin, and also were a visiting scholar at the Center of Gender Excellence at Linköping University in Sweden. In their current research project on transnationalism, Alyosha analyzes links between conceptualizations of transgender and transnational and aims for a critical redefinition of transnationalism and political agency. Alyosha is currently preparing a book manuscript with the working title Transit, Transfeminist Perspectives on Diasporas, Migrations and Community in Postcolonial Europe. Please help me to welcome Alyosha. Thank you, Nadia, for this generous introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here. It's always a special task to give a paper at your home institution. But as LSE is my, like, the GI is my second home, I'm not really at home. This is like the migrant condition, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> The three quotes that introduce this paper lay down tracks to indicate what is important for me in this project. It is not a coincidence that I start with Sarah, Sarah Ahmed's quote on feminism. Ahmed gives the word feminism life and meaning, grasps a dimension that I find incredibly important, the dimension of disobjectification, the political act of making thinkable, actionable, making, making intelligible, impossible, non-intelligible intelligible subjects. This process is not a voluntary act, but a fragile effect of collective politics, empowering positionings and transient political alliances. It is about coming into existence, about collective processes of turning oppression into resistance. Feminism as critical positioning spoke me into existence. Ahmed brings together feminism with the process of making thinkable, unthinkable, and unutterable positionings. 
It is about the process of making possible and livable accounts of oppos oppositional subjectivity. Fatima al Tayyab too problematizes processes of objectification in certain understandings of migration. She states that in heteronormative discourses of nation as well as migration, Europeans of color become the abjects, the impossible queer unsubjects. This means that discourses that define nation and migration as binary gendered and heteronormative and heteronormative and conceptualize racism only in terms of migration objectify Europeans of color. <coughs> Likewise, Ha et al. underline that racism is about the construction of non-Europe and non-Europeanness or Europe and Europeanness as binaries and that the brittle category migrant is insufficient for a critical anal anal analysis as it is based on and reproduces the exclusion of black Europeans and in consequence constructs Europe as white. Taking up these various perspectives on one set of problems, I argue that critical feminist scholarship on gendering, sexuality, migration, racism, nation and Europeanness urgently needs critical conceptualizations to make sense of com complex post-colonial geopolitics. We need to take a chance to open up new ways of thinking gendered racism and nationalism and its connection to migration in post-colonial Europe. In this paper, I want to make one main argument and discuss its implication, potential challenges and contradictions on various levels. I claim that a differentiation of racism and migratism is needed in critical feminist knowledge production concerned with rape, racism and migration in post-colonial Europe. This claim relies on and expands the insights of transnational feminist, post-colonial and queer and transgender feminist knowledge productions and queer and trans of color critique. With my analysis, I show that without this differentiation, feminist theory and activism reproduce Europe as a space free of race and thereby deny racism and the efficiency of racialization reduce transnationalism to a coexistence of homogenized national entities, render European, Europeans of color as the objects of discourses on migration and paradoxically racism in Europe, and repulse queer and trans-feminist diasporic political struggle to heteronormative binary gendering ideas of origin, family, culture and nation. I start with a disclaimer or with a, with a reaction to many misreadings of my migratism conceptualization that I have encountered in the last years. The migratism conceptualization is not to foreground the discrimination of white migrants, it is to sharpen their understanding of post-colonial racism in Europe. It is about grasping the description of migration as one strategy of racism and about understanding recent discursive racializations of migration. That, for example, the ascription of Eastern European migration to certain bodies, like in my case, in a German context, the ascription of Romanian migration and its discriminatory effects become theorizable through the concept is rather a byproduct than the main focus. Furthermore, it's not about privileged forms of border crossing in a supranational Western context. I say this because every time I talk about migratism in public, I have a person identifying with the concept who is certainly not meant by it. So, no, it's not about white Swedes in Norway and white Germans in the UK and white Canadians in Australia and white Danes in Poland. You get the point, I hope. Without me making me name um, all possible privileged border crossings. It is not about inventing discriminations, it is about conceptualizing migration and non-belonging as relying in, com in complex ways on post-colonial geopolitics, north, south, east, west divisions, and very often racialization. Overall, I call for a change of paradigms in activism and scholarship on migration in post-colonial Europe. Mainly, I argue for a post-colonial framing of migration and show the necessity of analyzing migratism, the discriminatory ascription of migration, always in relation to racism. 
<coughs> in so doing, I question optimized and oversimplified linkages between migration and racism. Today, I start with an anal analysis of quotes from feminist knowledge production on migration and from critical migration studies. Before, I expand on what migratism is and what a conceptualization of migratism might help us to think and do, I try to persuade you to read with me in order to follow me in feeling the need for such a conceptualization. I begin with a quote by Etienne Balibar, whose work is seen as one of the foundations for thinking of neo-racism and political belonging in Europe in many critical migration studies approaches and in leftist Marxist anti-globalization activism. More generally, the word immigrant is a catch-all category combining ethnic and class criteria into which foreigners are dumped indiscriminately, though not all foreigners and not only foreigners. The Portuguese, for example, will, will be more of an immigrant than a, Sp a Spaniard in Paris, though less than an Arab or a black. A Briton or a German certainly will not be an immigrant, though a Greek may perhaps be. I'll let you read it a moment. Balibar notes that there are differences in quality and extension of the discrimination of migrants. Some people, in this case in France, are seen as migrants and some are not. Balibar tries to get hold of these differences and uses nationalizing appellations in his, in his listing. Portuguese, Spaniard, Britain, German, Greek, and so on. The intention here is to discuss that not, all board, that not all border crossings are migrations, and that migrant is not a neutral category, which simply names the border crossing, but a, but a hierarchical ascription. In Balibar's analysis, to be constructed, constructed as a migrant in Western Europe relies on nationality or assumed na nation of origin, and sometimes on class. While, while I agree with his analysis, that not all border crossers are ascribed with migration. We can think of the differentiation between migrants and expats in recent media debates. And I agree that we need to understand migration as a category that produces hierarchies. I want to pro problematize his equation of nationalizing categories with, with racializing ones. You may have noticed it. In his list alongside the Spaniard, the German, and the Greek, Balibar's names the categories Arab and Black and states that these two are much more likely to be seen as migrants. However, with equating racializing categories with nationalizing ones, Balibar makes it possible to think of the makes it impossible to think of the nationalizing ones as something else than white. It is a racialized homogenization of nationality. In line with the nationalizing appellations like Spaniard and German, the mentioning of Arab and Black as different categories makes it impossible to think of Germans and Spaniards as Black or as Arab. Or to put it the other way around, his formulation suggests that Arabs and Blacks cannot be French, the French, but are migrants in all, in, in all events. Constructed as the eternal migrants who never can be at home in Paris. Balibar's formulation suggests that all the nationalized groups are not racialized and the racialized groups are automatically migrants in Europe. What the statement helps us to do is thinking the description of migration as not neutral, but hierarchical, and depending on geopolitical and classist power relations. It becomes clear that not every border crossing is a migration and that White Christian, I would add, Germans or Britons in France are not migrants. What it prevents us from doing is having a nuanced understanding of what racism in post-colonial Europe is and how it is connected not only to migration, but rather to the description of migration to certain bodies that are constructed as never at home in Europe. Racism functions in many Western European contexts through the strategy of ascribing migration the externalization of black and brown bodies from Europe. But it is a problem of Balibar's approach that he does not reflect on this. 
and by equating racializing categories with nationalizing ones, he rather reproduces hegemonic understandings of Europeanness as whiteness than help us to deconstruct this racist account. According to the idea of a so-called neo-racism approach, racism is the power relation that discriminates migrants. Let us think this through with the help of Balibar's example. I want to do this by having a closer look at the category Britain, who, as Balibar underlines, certainly will not be an immigrant in Paris. If Britain were a category that is above or beyond race, in consequence, this would mean that black Britons, because of being British, wouldn't be discriminated against in a racist way in France, because Britons are not seen as migrants in France. Their privileged nationality would overrule being constructed as non-white. We can ask ourselves, is this really the case? In another reading of this formulation, one could argue that the existence of black Britons is not thinkable within Balibar's framework. In my analysis of the text passage, the underlying logic rendered black Britons as abject and the category Britain is constructed as white within the possibilities of thinking that are offered in Balibar's approach. Balibar tries to define a power relation that constructs migration as a, a hierarchical category and touches on the idea that people who are constructed as non-white in Western context are ascribed with migration, even if they are not migrants at all. What is problematic about, about Balibar's approach is that he does not question and investigate the entanglement of migratization and racialization. What kind of power relations and geopolitics lie behind the description of migration? What role does colonialism play? What role does the construction of intelligible Europeanness play? How can hierarchies within Europe and the construction of European nations as racially homogenous be theorized and criticized? In which ways is racialization a construction that is entangled with migratization but not the same? The second example I want to discuss here is from a gender studies context. Building on an older piece by Braidotti and Griffin, this text discusses the relevance of critical whiteness studies for gender, gender studies knowledge productions in Europe. If European critical whiteness studies really attempt to establish whiteness as a racialized position, then we, we should probably, probably ask whether this goes in the right direction, especially since here, and we can at least say this for the contemporary, for contemporary Germany, racial categorization systems have much less importance for public and social life than in the United States. There is, as a Chen Balibar has prominently stated, racism without races. So at least concerning these forms of racism, we might conclude that the re-racialization of the European anti-racist discourse that critical whiteness studies attempt is unhelpful at best and misleading at worst." End of quote. The line of argumentation that I want to carve out here is the assumption that colonialism or racialization are irre irrelevant for analyzing racism in the European context. Fatima al Tayeb asserts that there is a form of invisible racialization in both media debates and academic discourses in continental Europe. She's, she argues racialization is constantly, constantly reproduced and ascribed on persons, but at the same time there is a prevailing collective attitude of purporting not, be, not being able to see racialization and therefore to deny the exist, existence in an impact on Europe. It is my claim that this attitude is paradoxically reproduced in some approaches on racism that understand stand themselves to be critical. The conceptualization of migration is only a relevant category for defining racism can therefore be understood as a reproduction of the racist tradition of denying the impact of racialization on Europe. With the argumentation that can be extracted from this quote, a discursive position is re reproduced that, as El Tayeb puts it, bemoans, I quote, a harmful introduction of race. 
She carves out a supranational pattern of racism in Europe that is determined through the convergence of race and religion, and most importantly, through the, quote, externalization of racialized populations. With the statement, here, I quote, here racial categorization systems have much less importance for public and social life than, than in the United States. It is denied that racial categorization systems have come into existence exactly here in Europe and are therefore constitutive of what Europe is in the first place. <coughs> Lines of argumentation that deny that racialization has an impact on Europe do not only deny white privileging, they even deny the very presence of black, brown, Asian, Roma, P and POC persons in Europe. In contrast, Audre Lorde argues in relation to African diasporic presence in Europe. I quote, yet the presence of Africa in Europe goes back to before the Roman Empire. The historical presence of black Africans in courts, university, monasteries, and bedrooms of the 17th, 18th, and 19th century Europe comes as a surprise only to those scholars pseudo-educated in Europeanized bastions of institutional ethnocentricity. So this is basically the point that Europe has never been white. I think it has become clear that conceptualizations of racism that understand migration as the only line of differentiation are insufficient insuff to grasp contemporary power relations in post-colonial Europe. In light of the recent public discussion of the so-called so refugee crisis in Europe, the term migrant becomes more and more a racialized category and the vocabulary is twisted in a specific way. My approach is a critique of understandings of contemporary racism in Europe as disconnected from post-colonial racialization and understandings of migration as disconnected from post-colonial geopolitics. This critique displaces the prevailing assumption in feminist theorizing on migration in critical, and in critical migration studies that, that the race racism is over or not applicable to Europe and opposes the idea that the only relevant racism is an anti-migration racism. My approach is not about giving a better account of reality. It is, it, is, it is about asking what certain conceptualizations allow us to do and to think and what their limitations are, what they even prevent us from doing and thinking. I'm in line here with Aftar Bra, Bra, who asks, how do we construct politics which do not reduce everything to the economy of the same and which do not essentialize difference? Rather than focusing primar primarily on migration and migrants, I concentrate on power relations that construct the ascription of migration, thereby also constructing both the privileged and the discriminated positionings in relation to migration. I call this process of construction migratism. On the one hand, this power relation ascribes migratization to people in a generalized and discrimin discriminatory way. On the other, it normalizes non-migratization. Similarly to how racialization and gendering are constructions which are not neutral, but which always function hierarchically, migration, like migration background, migration experience, etc., is not a neutral term. It's not an a priori category. The construction of migratized and non-migratized positionings through, through migratism does not only occur once, it is a perform performative it is performative in a Butlerian sense and occurs continuously and takes place in many different dimensions. I argue that the equation of racism and migratism renders Europeans of color into objects of theories on racism and reproduces them as objects of the hegemonic idea of Europeanness. The central argument for my conceptualization of the, the relation of racism and migration is that racism is not confined to description of migration but it's both a more far-reaching and, and an underlying power relation that constitutes societies and that constructs intelligible Europeanization and privilege, as privileged racialization. Ascription of migration are interconnected with post-colonial conditions. This does not mean, however, that every ascription of migration is therefore racist. 
But of course, racism and migratism are entangled. Racism can work through mig migratizing strategies. For example, when black Europeans are being asked where they actually come from. However, there, is also, there are also forms of migratization that are, not, that are not racist. For instance, when a white person is told that they have an Eastern European accent. That kind of statement does not automatically construct a person as non-white. The fixa fixation of people and groups of people to an elsewhere is the precondition and the driving force of the, the idea of migratization. And elsewhere has to, be, has to be imagined in order to mark the boundaries of the here and to regulate all border crossings, both on the level of national borders and on the level of boundaries of privileged privilege self-constructions. To give an example from feminist migration studies, I want to read with you a passage by Encarnacion Gutierrez Rodriguez. She reflects on, on the interview process in her own work and the interaction with her interviewees that is defined by their different positionings to, towards post-colonial racialization. Gutierrez Rodriguez positions herself as a white privileged feminist who has grown up in Germany and has a family history of work migration from Spain. Her interviewees are mostly non-white migrant women from Latin America working in Germany or in the UK. Gutierrez Rodriguez tells us a bit of the story of her own discrimination growing up in Germany. I quote, Oh, you're a child of a foreigner. You smell of garlic and they always insult you. You encounter teachers who rejected you because you couldn't speak German. Then there was this form of racism. And this leaves a mark on you, even as an adult. Because you are in a different country and you don't want to be here, because you are, with you, you, you are with your parents and it's different because you are not part of the society and before in Spain you were. This quote, quote provides an argumentation that I use for a sharpened distinction between racism and migratism. The relation of discrimination and violence that I have named migratism as part of the new approach detailed here is called in Gutierrez Rodriguez's approach a form of racism. She discloses discriminations and stereotyping descriptions and discusses her own experiences in, the, in Germany in the 1970s. As a white privileged migratized person in Germany, I myself have experienced discriminations that follow a very similar pattern. Broadly speaking, the main issue are the description and degradation of the smell of garlic, denial of the knowledge of the German language, the question, when are, you, when are you going back, experiences of physical and mental violence by teachers, hindrances to pursuit a, a higher education, and so on. Why is my situation comparable to the experience described by Gutierrez Rodriguez, although our positionings differ in terms of class, nationality, citizenship, etc., and are situated in different parts of Germany at different points in time in a changing Europe. My answer to that question is that German structural migratism is the foundation of this pattern of othering. Even if I, if I agree with Gutierrez Rodriguez's analysis for the most part, I'm calling for a differentiation between racism and migratism. So I wouldn't call it a form of racism uh, as she does. As Gutierrez Rodriguez herself writes in her article, her Ecuadorian interview partner Carla <coughs> brought to her attention, I quote, the incompatibility of our different positionalities and white privilege. Gutierrez Rodriguez makes the following, following remarks about the interview with Carla. Carla started to talk about the racism she experienced during her childhood as an indígena. Her childhood was marked by the experience of forced assimilation under Spanish rules. As her mother tongue, Quechua, was forbidden at school, she could only speak it at home. Carla simply focused on the differences between my story and hers, situated in post-colonial post conjunctures and disjunctures. In this interview, Carla demonstrates one of the differences between migratism and racism. So I talk now, I took over the interviewee. Um, Carla demonstrates one of the differences between migratism and racism that I would like to elaborate on here. 
I put color is re represented in Gutierrez Rodriguez. She says, it does not only happen because you are from a different country, but also when you are in your own country. End of quote. Here, colonialism is clearly the framework within which a form of discrimination becomes a form of racism. The social positionings of both actors are hierarchized and codified as indigena and white through colonial racism. This racialization takes place beyond migration experiences and the description of migration. I claim that the account of the interview with Carla vividly demonstrates that racialization has, has also powerful effects beyond migratization. Both interviewer and interviewee are migrants in a um, Western European context. But Carla emphasizes the privileging that is linked to whiteness and to migratized whiteness, as the case might be. For that reason, I argue that it makes sense to analytically separate racism and migratism from one another in order to examine them in differentiated ways as mutually constitutive and entangled with each other. Okay, now in order to, my, to complicate my own claim, I want to turn now to a specific example and discuss hegemonic readings and misreadings of racialization, migratization, and national belonging and problematize attempts to correct certain description or to assume stable categories of belonging. I'm read as a dyke or, or as a trans person in specific contexts, in different moments and places. In others, I'm read as a teenage boy which transes me potentially too. When I'm read as a woman, indeed always a gender deviant woman, my age is read in a way corresponding to the conventionalized data in my papers. When I'm read as male, it, is always, it always reduces the age people read, people read. When I'm read as a teenage boy, people mostly read me also as migratized in Western Europe. When I'm read as a gender deviant woman, people mostly re read me as non-migrant. When I'm read as migratized, I mostly get read, as read too as male. When I'm, when I'm read as non-white, I'm never read as black, but as migratized and therefore PSC. And in Kreuzberg, Berlin, where I have considered, my, considered myself to be at home for a long time, in most of these cases, migratized equates Muslim, equates POC, as being a migrant there means being a Muslim in a hegemonic understanding. In other words, Despite my being privileged through racism, sometimes I am read as a person of color, namely when I am read as migratized and the description of my migration becomes racialization. It happens very rarely that I am not read as white, but it happens at, time, at times. Do these readings turn me into a boy, into a teenager, a woman, a Muslim, a non-migrant, a person of color discriminated by racism? If one of transnational feminism's projects is to go beyond the national, to criticize the stabilization of nations and nationality as natural entities and to fight nationalism, might the term transnationalism thus be misleading, carrying nationalism within it, and maybe not only on a terminological level? So I will come back in my uh, previous thoughts back to the example from the beginning just wanted to open up this kind of like the complex of uh, reading and misreading and descriptions and of unstable categories um, I don't suggest to replace the conventionalized term transnationalism in my approach but rather play around with different levels of meaning in order to redefine the work of transing in the term, question the reliance on categories and intervene in reproductions of nationalism. Here I discuss transnationalism as in cross-border nationalism, a form of minority, minority nationalism in migrant communities that construct the diaspora as extension of the homeland. Has written, has written 1998 on a similar pattern. I argue that this form of transnationalism is rooted in practicing, practicing racism and reproducing hetero and binary gender norms. In my readings of the example, it is my aim to intervene in the logic of minority nationalisms and the idea of co 
and the idea that cooptation by majority nationalisms is a desirable goal on the way to, I quote, Aaron Azura, belonging without complication to a normative social sphere. What happens if white persons are being read as non-white? What happens, for example, if persons, of, if persons who consider themselves as being white Romanians are being read in Western European contexts as Roma? Is this description anti-Romaist? And if so, for whom? For those who define, define themselves as white Romanians, or for the Roma, or for both? In 2011, the fascist Romanian party, Noa Drepta, launched a poster campaign in Italy. Here is the poster. On the posters, one can see two photos with Italian text. In my reading, the photo on the left side is meant to represent a Roma family, the one on the right side, a hetero retrogendered Romanian family. Under the right photo, there is the Italian word for Romanians, and under the left, the Italian anti Roma is word for Roma, followed by Rom in brackets, <coughs> the Italian word for Roma. Below the two images, one can read the demand, notice the difference, and then the sentence, they are two different or dissimilar people. The Roma family is represented as dressed colorfully and arranged as a chaotic open group in front of fans in the streets. The Romanian family is draped in a photo studio setting, all dressed in white shirts or blouses and grouped in a closed arrangement. In my reading, the latter are blonde much blonder than my own image of family belonging and Romanianess would ever suggest. The ones who are supposed to be recognized as Romanians are constructed as white through visualized representations of skin and hair color, as well as through clothing. It is about representing intelligible Europeanization and even more intelligible middle Europeanization. The Roma family is constructed in opposition to this as non-white. With this construction of the Romanian family, a middle European norm of bourgeois family is reproduced. This is realized via the ordered grouping in the contrast to the disorder of the construction of the Roma family and the relatable and ambiguous representation of kinship age, number of persons, and gender. The norming of whiteness gets entangled here with the norming of binary, hetero, and retronormativity. In my own reading, the Romanian family is constructed as co consisting of father, mother, and three children, while the, on the other photo, the retrostructure remains must, mu much less clear. Noah Drapter's posters react to a broader disposition in Romania and in Romanian migrant groups in Western Europe. There is an omnipresent readiness to complain about the fact that in Western European context, Romanian and Roma get confounded. Therefore, the Romanians request a differentiation between these two terms that are constructed as mutually exclusive in hegemonic Rom Romanian discourses. There are, for example, attempts to enforce in Romania and in the EU the official replacement of the appellation Roma with the, with the anti-Romanist word in order to prevent confusing it with Romanian. Thus, in 2010, the Romanian president, Traian Mazescu, is cited as explaining that, he, that the request for differentiate, differentiating between the two categories was for, I quote, protecting the Romanians in gypsophobic regions as the bad treatment and negative discrimination of Roma could affect in an unjustified way Romanians too. With this statement, Bazescu externalizes anti-Romaism and locates it outside of Romania. At the same time, he constructs anti-Romaism as something that can affect Romanians in an unjustified way. This implicates that, in his opinion, there is a group of persons that can be affected by anti-Romaism in a justified way. However, in Romania, the Roma exposed to immense discrimination. Discriminations explicates Jennifer Chanaka. Moreover, there are constant attempts from the side of the white Romanians to distinguish themselves from the Roma. Aniko Imre asserts 
in relation to Hungary that the white Christian population of Eastern Europe has decided to distance itself from the Roma in order to mask the insecurity about their own identity. According to Imre, one reason for the ongoing attempts of the Eastern European white Christian population to distinguish, to distinguish themselves from the Roma is the fact that Western media does not that Western media does not differentiate between the two cultures. I quote, Eastern Europeans are treated as gypsies by the Western media, says Imre. <coughs> Imre uses the anti-Roma as a discriminatory appellation gypsies repeatedly in her text. Moreover, she conducts a problematic twist in her argument. In her opinion, not the anti-Romaism of the Eastern European mainstream population is responsible for their, for their vehement delineation from the, from the Roma, but the fact that they are treated like Roma in Western European discourses and because their cultures get, get conflated. I don't agree, but instead propose that anti-Romaism provides the opportunity for white Christian Eastern Europeans, the aspirants of Western European participation, as Manuela Vodka puts it, to demonstrate their whiteness and to construct themselves as intelligibly European. There is no doubt that in Western discourses, Western European discourses, uh, that constructs Romanians and Romania, that they are discriminating. Following Maria Todorova and Manuel, Manuela Botka understands the construction of, of Southeastern Europe as interstage between Orient and Occident. I quote, moreover, Southeastern Europe's proximity to Asia and its Ottoman cultural legacy located at halfway between East and West, thus giving it a condition of the semi-Oriental, semi-civilized, semi-developed. End of quote. It becomes evident that the European separation has been established for centuries and is not rooted in the relatively short period of state socialism and the construction of the Eastern Bloc states vodka. Eurocentric assumptions of backwardness are transferred to southeastern Europe. It is constructed as, I quote, vodka, Europe, Europe's inc incomplete self by Orientalist discourses as epi epigonal Europe in broadcast works, <coughs> trying to prove its proper Europeanness but constantly failing. Racism, nationalism and fascism can be used as strategies to construct intelligible Europeanness. I quote, the aspiration to Europeanness, as Botka puts it. So the aspiration to Europeanness, as Botka puts it, is legitimized through the racist practices of the aspirants. In a migration context, this is realized through a phenomenon that I call transnationalism or cross-border nationalism. Persons who are constructed as Romanians in Western European contexts are without doubt discriminated against by migratism, and Romania gets devalued chauvinistically in many dimensions. <coughs> In recent nationalist debates in Western Europe, the terms Romanians and Roma are indeed mostly used as synonyms. However, through the analysis of my example, it becomes clear that the attempt to correct the misreading of one's own social positioning and to persist on controlling the representation of oneself is not automatically emancipatory, but can be racist and self-privileging. With their racist delineation against the Roma, the white Romanians try to annul their marginalization within a system of hierarchies in Europe. Building, building on Poir's conceptualization of homonationalism, this phenomenon, which of course does not only occur in Romanian migrant communities, can be named as transnationalism or cross-border nationalism. The attempts of a migratized group to assimilate to the nationalist mainstream of their country of origin. Moreover, cross-border nationalism relies on invoking racist nationalisms as the, as the supranational commonality of Europeanness and self-construction allows for a Romanian... Moreover, Cross-border nationalism relies on invoking racist nationalisms as the supranational commonality of Europeanness and self-construction as intelligibly European. In my example, 
fascist supranationalism allows for, allows for a Romanian fascist group with the help of an Italian fascist group to launch an anti roma post campaign in Italy to secure the borders of intelligible Europeanization. Theorists such as Fatima and Hayek formulate critiques of these efforts to belong to the norm in European contexts. There is a tendency, she says, among, amongst white, non-migrant gays, bisexual and lesbians to want to be recognized, to be normal, to dissolve as unmarked within the nation. But Hayek called this adap adaption and hyper-pronunciation of conservative ideas, the preaching of traditional values and the insistence of, uh, on normality, um, I quote, solidarization with the mainstream, end of quote. Instead of practicing solidarity with the marginalized and deconstructing mechanisms of marginalization, this attitude reproduces sexist, racist, and neoliberal exclusions. The, logic of, the logics of homonationalism can be applied also to cross-border nationalism, and a similar process is discussed by Jasper Poir and herself. After 9-11, there occurred in the U.S. a series of hate crime murders against Sikhs as they were read as presumed Muslim terrorists. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about the, the knowledge production of Jasper Puar here. These hate were answered by, by an educational campaign with the goal of self-representing Sikhs as a group who person, could personify a form of, I quote, proper American heteromasculinity and could therefore be distinguished from the perverted terrorist bodies, the real Muslims. Poor notices that attempts of delineation are rooted in the idea that the white Christian majority would be interested in the difference between two groups, that both are constructed as non-white. Through the desolidarization with Muslims, some Sikhs try to inscribe themselves into the US American nation. But this undertaking cannot succeed, underlines poor. Applied to the violent self-construction of white Romanians as not Roma, uh, to the expense of a re-essentialization of Roma as the real Roma, the question remains whether in this context and constellation the undertaking can actually succeed. Is it possible for white Romanians to wrench recognition from white Western Europeans in order to be, to be perceived as, as intelligible European? So here um, is a very interesting example in 2013. Um, apparently when the, when the uh, borders of the EU opened to Romanians um, to have be free for work migration to the UK, um, some officials in the UK started to have this kind of like uh, uh, discriminatory um, speeches against the Romanians and the Bulgarians, um, the migration of the Romanians and the Bulgarians, and then there was a, a campaign in a newspaper in Romania in 2013 as like answer to this. And it was like they had this kind of advertisement saying half of our women look like Kate, the other half like her sister. And this is an interesting um, attempt here again, like through sexism and normative gendering um, to inscribe themselves as being like uh, normal Euro white Euro Europeans as uh, the Britons um, too. And it's, it's interesting, so of course it's like half of our women and so on. So you have here like this kind of like um, like really um, ridiculous reproduction of um, sexism and um, heteropatriarchy to show that um, uh, they are um, the same as the British. The situation that is discussed in Puar's text is different from my example here, and the differences lies in the self-construction of the group that seeks to be read correctly. In the case of the Romanians, the self-construction is rooted in whiteness, Christianity and Europeanness. In the case of the Sikhs, this is not the case. What connects both examples is the similar process of desolidarization and also the overemphasis of sexist, retro and heterogender norms in order to secure a place within a non-deviant part of the nation or Europe. Applying Hornchild's conceptualization 
of pejorization, it can be argued that the description as Roma of white Romanians is discriminatory. However, not against the white Romanians, but against the Roma. A straight cis woman who gets appellated as lesbian, Honchat argues, can only perceive this as a hurt if she reproduces straightness of desirable norm as a desirable norm and being a lesbian is something negative. Thus, perceiving lesbian as a slur is harmful for lesbians and not for straight women. Applied to the description as Roma, this is also fundamentally true for the appellation. To perceive it as a harm to be named as Roma, to understand the appellation as a slur, the misreading as Roma is wrongful, reproduces anti-Romaism. I follow <coughs> Hornschild's analysis that straight women who feel wrongly interpolated as lesbians reproduce in this idea of wrongfulness, lesbophobia, and heteronormative gendering. In order to extend this concept, however, one could ask, how many performative repetitions of the appellation lesbians does it take for a straight cis woman to unbecome a straight cis woman? And to be constructed discursive, discursively as a lesbian? Or does she become then a straight woman who gets discriminated like a real lesbian? Or does not, or, but does not become a real lesbian? Let me refer back to my own example of being misread as a Muslim migrant adolescent boy. How many readings does it take to become that Muslim migratized boy I am mistaken for? In relation to my example of cross-border nationalism, what one could ask, if white Romanians can become Romas through repeated, with repeated performative, one could ask if white Romanians can become Romas through repeated performative appellations as Roma. Does this happen, and if so, after how many repetitions? For whom does it happen? for the white Western Europeans, who are the appellators, or for the de-whitened Romanians, who get appellated, or for the Roma, who become abjects. Especially in countries like Italy and Spain, where many guest workers from Romania live, guest workers, I should say, there occur repeated incidents such as pogroms against Romanian Roma, but also against white Romanians. For example, rape and, rapes and murders of Romanian women, mostly sex workers, that are not only that are only faint-heartedly persecuted. Is it, it is not traceable if these persons are all murdered or attacked for anti-Romanian <coughs> reasons. And if this was the case, would the fact of a white Romanian woman being killed by anti-Romanism be such an unambiguous description of being Roma that in death the murdered becomes Roma? Or is, is this only mistaken identity? Why do killings appear to be more unambiguous manners of death and more valid certainties of violence than slow death, as Lauren Bellon puts it, manners of death that, are death that are not recognized as such? Which roles do intersectional, intersectional power relations like sexism, migratism, and racism play in relation to the incidents, slow death, and killings? All these questions could be answered in various dimensions. Of course, I don't post them here to find out the exact moment and the exact situation in which a person becomes what they are ascribed. But to raise attention to the idea, of the, to the idea that processes of becoming and, perform, and perform, performative descriptions have a complex connection. In other words, I don't pose the questions because I want to find unambiguous answers, but because I want to provoke a reflection on how discrimination and power relations construct and fix persons or their social positionings through performative acts. Following Ahmed, I argue that ascription of non-whiteness do not automatically mean to become non-white and ascriptions of masculinity do not automatically mean to become a man. Moreover, processes of gendering and racialization do not function in a parallel way and transing gender is not the same as deconstructing racialization. So performative processes of becoming through repeated interpolation are intersectional in many dimensions, but might work in contradictory ways. Ahmed <coughs> substantiates this with the, I quote, reopening and restaging of a fractured history of identification, end of quote. 
This means that Roma who are read as Roma have a history of self-identification and identification through others that is formed by the discrimination by anti-Romanism, while white Romanians have a history of self-identification and identification through others that is formed by the privileging of anti by anti-Romanism. Roma, in contrast to white Romanians, do not have the possibility to construct themselves as white through a mixture of racist, nationalist, gendered, and sexualized norms. The self-construction of the white Romanian migrants shows that neither crossing borders nor the status as migrant automatically creates a critical attitude or the rejection of national belonging, nationalism, or Eurocentrism. What becomes, what becomes clear here is that power relations and their analysis are, and my students will know what I say now, complex. <laughs> With the suggested conceptualization, I aim to contribute to transnational gender studies that are invested in analyzing genderings, sexualities, postcolonial geopolitics, diasporas and migration, and their entangled and contradictory complexities. My approach is not about separating struggles against racism from those against migratism, nor do I want to deny that racism and migratism have a specific interconnection. On the contrary, I argue that anti-racist and anti-migratist struggles have a long shared history and my research underlines the necess necessity to carefully analyze the construction of gendered racialization in Europe and its relationship to migration and to the description of migration to certain bodies. I argue that not only the construction processes are complex, but also that the knowledge production in transnational gender studies is blurry, ambivalent, complex, contradictory, and uncomfortable. This is what we have to endure and use as constant challenge and potential in struggle for and in knowledge production on, ra on radical social transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alyosha. We can share. So, um, well, this was um, very complex, <laughs> uh, very interesting, and I'm sure you have some questions or comments, but I'm, I'm going to start kicking off, and I don't expect you to answer, because I would like to take some questions, and then maybe at the end. So, I guess, for me, as an anthropologist, <laughs> when I think about and the way that sexism, racism, and migratism intersect in my experience, having lived in Germany, having grown up in Germany, and then here, um, I feel that uh, it has changed quite a bit. I mean, I feel that since you know when I grew up to now, um, the intersections have shifted quite a bit, depending on the way that the political, social economic context has shifted. Um, so I guess sort of one comment for me would be, or one thing to think about, is how this relationship, this intersectionality, how is it historically specific and shifting? And you know, I'm thinking specifically now, for instance, I mentioned this at the last talk, the incidents in Cologne, and how all of a sudden there's a kind of privileging of um, or a recognition that sexism is existent in German society, why maybe sort of 20 years ago no one would really care about it in the context of increased migratism and racism. And so there is a relationship between the way that these you know, different forms of power configurations uh, play out. Um, thinking back about my own experience of growing up, and I you know, can relate to many of the things that, that you are sharing, uh, but I think to maybe complicate things even further, there is also class. When I think about, um, you know, I think there's a huge difference um, if you are, as they say in German, of Migrationshintergrund, which means migration background, and you could be third or fourth generation, and you would still be called Migrationshintergrund. Uh, in terms of the resources that you have when you're middle class, as opposed to 
and working class. I think that class is very important. And certainly when I compare the German context and the British context, I think there are huge differences in terms of the meaning and signification attached to whiteness and blackness. So I think one of the things I'd like you to reflect on what I'm not a proponent of Brexit, but I wonder how much can we speak about Europe and how much do we have to be specific in terms of you know, the specific history of colonialism and migration um, in Germany as opposed to the UK. Okay, I, I think I'll stop here. So, um, questions, comments? Yes, please. So, so can I connect a few years? Thank you very much. supranational and that um, basically define what westernness is um, and that I think that specific forms of racialization work that way but at the same time there are patterns of racialization that are really specific to certain contexts and I think that most research that is done on Europe as a whole or Western Europe more or less is um, done, for example, you can think of uh, Fatima Al-Tayyad, European others, she explicitly <coughs> says this is on continental Europe, this is, this is in, in the UK it works in a different way. Um, and I think this is true, and I still think that there are um, su supranational patterns that, that are true for the UK and for Germany and for Fra France and so on. Um, but I do think that uh, racialization and the description of migration might function in a, di in a different way in the UK. Um, and I think um, it, it is what, what was really in my trajectory, like doing the PhD in Sweden um, and then coming here, um, for me it became really clear that in Sweden, in, in Germany, I was constructed as um, migratized um, mainly through the rolling R when I speak German and through um, this idea that Germans are blonde or something. So it, it was this shifting concept of like visualize, visualizing normalizations. When I moved to Sweden, I became even more migrant because uh, Swedish think of themselves to be super blonde. And um, when I came to, to the UK, um, I became the German, right? And this is, 
I think this is really interesting because, of course, it, it's my my Ronnie R is gone when when I speak um, English. I have the German accent, right? And and uh, the the visualizer visualizing um, normalizations do not ascribe so rigidly migration to non-blonde white people, right? So it's 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 certainly different. Um, like talking about Germany, I I totally think that there is like in the post-colonial, in the post-war move, like in the post-war moment until now, that there are huge shifts and there are things that stay the same. So we can link this maybe to discussing what post-colonialism means, for example, and to discuss the post as rupture and continu continuity. And I think there is a post-colonial racism that has ruptures and continu can continuities to um, colonial racialization that play an important role. And I think this example I had uh, uh, by Gutierrez Rodriguez, who talks as a white Spanish person with a guest migrant background uh, in Germany, um, I think that in the 60s and 70s, like through class as well, the description of migration to people from the south of Europe worked in a very specific way. I would still think, um, and this is like, um, I have discussed that in my broader research, that that is rooted in whiteness, that these people could even come to Germany because, and of course it's blurry because we, we know that Turkey was, for example, one of the countries um, that had the main uh, people um, coming to Germany. And at that time, in the Western context, Turkey was, could pass as one, as a European nation more or less. So, but, and of course, um, so there, there are documents, for example, on the on internal documents um, from officials from the times, where it becomes clear that, for example, black Portuguese people wanted to come um, as guest uh, workers to Germany, and that uh, German officials like uh, in secretly blocked that because they said when we when we call for Portuguese workers, we want white white workers. So um, there was a was an idea of taking workers in, but only take, taking white people in. And of course, they could not really control it because they, they had Turkey and the, the, the <coughs> racialization of Turks shifted um, in the hegemonic discourse. And then you had, um, for example, a migration from um, ex-Yugoslavia, where a lot of Roma people came, and there was no register to distinguish between Roma and non-Roma Yugoslavian people, so they could not control if only white people come or not. Um, and I think, like when we talk now about um, the situation in Germany, what you said that the, there is more aware, awareness of sexism. Well, I don't think it's more awareness. Yeah. There's so, more space. I mean, it's so instrumentalized. The more it's instrumentalized. I think that correlations are good, are played out against yes, each other, yes, yes. and I think that that this is basically one of the strategies how racism and migration yes. function to externalize sexism, mm -hmm. and this has like the two. This has two two basic problems, right? So one is the externalization of sexism. So it's it's. It's a double thing, so it gets externalized and homophobia too. Externalized to the outside of Europe, and at the same time it gets externalized to persons who are constructed as being outsiders, to migrants. Um, and then this has the consequence that is the descriptions are racist and on the one hand, um, and, and constructs the migrants and the outsiders and non-white people as um, in a racist way as sexist, more sexist than others, than white Europeans. And on the other hand, it has the consequence that sexism that exists and that is like constitut constitutive for, for what Germany and Western, Western nations are cannot be addressed anymore. So this is like, and so it, it becomes normalized and not, 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 intervention become impossible, basically. Um, the urban and the rural thing, um, so I grew up in the south of Germany in a, in a small town uh, far away from any city. Um, it was awful. Um, <laughs> Um, I I don't I don't know I think that I, I, don't, I really don't know I'm not I, I think I'm not a friend of 
like this idea is that people have to know strangers in order to, to respect strangers. So I think the construction of the stranger takes place maybe in, on different, in di different dimensions, but you have the construction of the stranger um, if the stranger is pro proximate or not. So I actually, I, I think that there may be are conjunctures of different forms of racism and migratism, but I don't think that they differ very much, that big cities are the exception, like this kind of um, not so migrat, not so migratist, not, we could think of not so homophobic, not so sexist um, space, and I wouldn't be sure. I think, of course, you have like more people when you have more people, you have more diversity too. So you have, you, if you're lucky, you find more people who are not so stupid. Or <laughs> <laughs> um, so the maybe I can combine the solidarity question with the strategic essentialism question. I, I think like it's funny that you bring it up because I. I especially took this up, the, the strategic, strategic essentialism question. And I think, so Spivak defined the term and, said, and later says, oh, actually, I don't, I, so I, I actually, I haven't meant it that way. So basically, Spivak uses the term and then later says, oh, it was taken up in very problematic ways. And what I think is that we have to think about in transnational feminist um, um, communities and struggles and like this kind of ideas of coming together and um, failing and departing again and trying new politics and like in this scattered ways. I think that it's important to think about um, identity and belonging and community and struggle and uh, beyond strategic essentialism. I think it's it's a problem to do this and I think this is really not what I wanted to do with the term. So. Um, but I think it's interesting to discuss it because the strategy you write could be could be described as st strategic essentialism that can, can be found in this transnationalist uh, approaches, and I think it's um, I think it's a problem to to even if I know what you mean when you say you understand it, I think it's a problem to do to try to, to be in a better position to the expense of uh, discriminating some, somebody else, right? So I think this is kind of like. Um, one of the main things that is important in, in struggles for radical social transformation to go beyond the essentialism idea. And this does not mean, in my opinion, to deny the constructions of essentialisms that, that take place all the time. So it's about, of course, like categories are constructed and discriminations functions function on the base of constructed categories at the same time, so we have to deconstruct the categories all the time, but we have to know about the construction process and about the power that lies behind it. So, and I think this is connected to the solidarity. I, I don't know, Verena, if you, if you want me now to come up with the theorization of solidarity, what I mean is, <laughs> yeah, what I mean by it is, I, I think that this is like the constant re reflection process that has to take place in, in communities, in alliances uh, for um, uh, radical social transformation, that um, it is so. It's not so easy. You have this. It's complex, right? <laughs> so um, you have this idea um, that is you, that you can find, for example, a lot in space approach that you have to. You need politics that always depart from the most vulnerable uh, positioning. But of course, it's it's the question like who defines what the most vulnerable positioning is. Right, so this is, and, uh, I think, while I am sympathetic with the idea, I think this has to fail. So, so I think this is like, it's a constant, like, going around thinking about power relations, negotiating power relations, like, enduring the contradictions in social movements, because it's like, you, you will have always contradictions, you will have always people who say, like, completely opposite things, and you have to negotiate them. And I think solidarity starts there, like, to negotiate what you can take, take on and what, what you still want to negotiate and there might be things you don't want to negotiate and then you have to leave and then, then it, you have a clash and then you go like it's, it is scattered and you come again and find different alliances and I think this is the thing to think beyond single issue politics 
um, always to, to like oppose single issue politics at the same time to know that we cannot know um, if we don't fall in the, into the trap of reproducing single issue politics. So it's this ongoing process. Hi, thank you so much for your paper. And I love your critique of the uh, um, My question has to do with um, language and how you're using language and how you're actually trying to transform um, conceptual understandings through the language you're using. But um, when you think about the term migrant and its derivatives, it actually refers to race and essentialism at the heart of the very concept, because migrant assumes that you're coming from somewhere in a way that almost defines you and you're going somewhere else. And the reason, and so I was wondering about you know, how you might overcome that in the language and when you talk rather about movement. And I'm asking this because I'm, um, I was born in London, I'm Canadian, and I lived in France for 10 years. And when I lived in France, no one would accept that I'm Canadian. I'm like, oh, where are you from? I'm in Canada. <laughs> no, no, where are you really from? What are your origins, right? And so there's an assumption there, exactly what you're talking about, that I could not come from Canada. <laughs> I had to come from somewhere else before that. Um, and so I think underlying this concept, of migrant is this type of emotion that you have to have some sort of a rootedness, some sort of belonging, and that's what gives you your identity. And then if you move from that, then um, and then there's also the assumption that you might go back. So it's just one of the rules about the use of language and that. Um, I'm really interested in this uh, re reading practices thing that you talked about at different points in the paper. Um, and partly because I'm thinking, well, there's lots of things I think about it. I was hoping that you were going to say how many times you needed to be read or something before you would read it. <laughs> um, but I wonder if also there's something interesting about, I mean, it's obviously partly about the difference between. Um, kind of um, being something and, 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 the, uh, and the phobia. So, you know, if you're read as, as a Muslim but you're not, then you might still say that you're subject to Islamophobia, even, even or maybe not. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but also I think there's something, I, I'm, I don't know, it's just a thought, but like, if you're read as, if you're read as any, anything, in some senses, isn't that always a misreading? And isn't there a danger that, in some sense, one posits the lesbian who is subject to lesbian discrimination as, in a sense, less subject to a to a misreading? Whereas, of course, in some senses, all homophobic readings are misreadings because nobody checks with you first, right? And all all Islamophobic uh, readings are misreadings in the sense that that their purpose is not to identify the difference between who are or are not Muslim, the people who are or are not lesbian, but to performatively produce the Muslim or the lesbian in that moment. And so I, I, I would worry a bit about it. It's the danger somehow that, 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 that we also get caught up in kind of who's the real lesbian who's subject to, to, to homophobia rather than the way in which the lesbian is constructed in that moment, whether the person sees themselves as that or not. And that the seeing yourself as that is the solidaristic response. And then I have a second question which is even, which is horrible. Which is I am not sure of the relationship between those reflections and the distinction between racism and migratism, though I think it's I can sort of mm, I have a feeling about it, but I can't could you sort of maybe mm, restate the connection between those reading practices and the, and that distinction? Um, you sometimes use transnational together, and I've seen you use it apart with an underscore. I'm just wondering um, if you could speak to why you decided to use that particular form of it in this presentation. So you have one more question. It's more like a comment. <clears throat> I mean, my knowledge is quite limited in your, in your discipline. But what I like about it, I, I found it very solid in that it allows you, theoretically solid, in that it allows us to 
move to south, south, sort of, you know, racist, or migratist, or, you know, like, because I keep thinking about refugees in Lebanon, and I think what you're proposing is a wonderful framework. I mean, I thought I shouldn't say wonderful because it's horrible. <laughs> but you see what I mean. Because what I get mostly is, basically, there's no such thing as an individual person. You, you are whatever, in as far as you construct yourself, as opposed or beyond or beside or within, you know, the other. And then it made me think about privilege, you know, this aspiration to Europeanness. Mm. It's a very special kind of privilege. It's not like the privilege you are born, you know, that we, that we come to, that we come with into the world. It's almost like being privileged if you can prove your, your Europeanness, you know, even if you're Lebanese and you have nothing to do with Europe, like, and you speak Arabic and you're Muslim and you lived in Tripoli all your life, for example. I don't know, that just a sort of symbolic something, you know, aura that makes you special. Mm -hmm. It's very complex, but I keep imagining this. Then maybe I, I'm, while answering, I come back to the last point, but to ask you again about what you mean. And we can speak about yeah. it later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you, I think. Yeah. Um, we're was the first wait, migrant? Yes. Um, yeah, well, I think this is exactly what, to, what I want to try to grasp with the conceptualization, what you describe here, that um, like w white Canadians in France are not described with migration, and they they are not asked where are you from, and are you, and so and when they are <coughs> they speak uh, English, then it's it's not this migrat it's not the migratizing. Um, question. It's a more a question like, oh, we we all travel and we all cross borders, right? And so, and I think that that is really that uh, the migrat migratism concept does the two levels to to state to to talk about the description of migration, but then to as well um, talk about how racism functions very often through the description of migration, even if it's totally phantasmatic. So, and I think that. Um, the, the, the concept migrant, um, or I use the term sometimes in order to tr translate because it gets used. So to to, trans to to have a term that is that we like that we all have agreed on. We, but I think basically it's a problematic, and I would agree a pro pro problematic term. And I think recently in the, in the recent media debates, migrant there is a new twist to the usage of migrant. And um, because it gets like um, equated with refugee, and it gets it gets racialized in a very specific way um, again. And so I think the I think that there. So I think I think the whole concept, uh, the whole point I want to make is that to talk about migratization rather than to talk about migrants, for example, and to, to think about at what points. Are, is migration ascribed and for what reasons and in what discourses and what's the function of it and the effect of it and so on and how does it, how is it connected to racialization on various levels? I don't know if this answers very well. Can I come back? It does. Yeah, but I think that there is at the heart of the term something racist there actually. And then um, also I was confused as to how you use the term migratism. And what you mean by it? I, in fact, I don't even know the term. It's just only when I use it. Um, yeah, you, you don't know it because I invented it. That's what I mean. <laughs> 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 and so, yeah, I think I need my criticism. Yeah. Well, I think it's 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 uh, to to try to name the power relation that describes migration and that constructs migrants, and this is very often racist, but it's not in all cases racist. Um, like for example. Um, White, my, white people who are described with migration um, uh, from Eastern Europe in Western European context. And I think it's, it's about, but it's really not about the focus on the white migrants, it's about the, the focus on the migratizing strategies of racism and how this does not reflect the reality. And, like it's not about talking about reality, it's about discursive uh, descriptions. Thank you. Um, what is clear is the next one. Misreadings, 
the misreadings. I this is actually I, I want I don't want to to re-essentialize the real lesbians and the real Muslims and the, the real Roma. And I try to really, but maybe I have to be a thank, so thank you, I have to be more <coughs> explicit about this. I think the, like the underlying idea of real Roma and real lesbians is a problem, of course. And I don't want to say that some, I, I think I don't want to say that um, we can find, so we cannot find, we don't know. So I think this is one of my points. We, it's so complex and we don't know and I'm just asking the question, is there a difference of um, if you are not, if you, do, if you don't live a life that, um, well, how do I put this now? <laughs> so if you don't, if, if you, if you um, are, if you have straight privileges and then you get described as a lesbian, is there a difference to the description of being a lesbian if you don't have straight privilege, right? So, or is it the, the, the same? Huh? That's a very good way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think this, uh, so I, I'm, actually I've been interested a long, for a long time in this kind of complex things without finding a solution. For example, you have this 2005 bombing in the London Tube, and after um, the police killed this Brazilian guy um, because they mistook him as, as, one, uh, as one of the terrorists. And I think here you kind of start with the whole complex thing. So, so they mistook it, him for a terrorist. This means they mistook him for a Muslim. This means they equate Muslims with terrorists. This means <coughs> they equate brown bodies with Muslims. They equate brown bodies with terrorists. So um, was it Islamophobia that killed him or was it something different? Right? And I think I don't pose the question because I want to find out the like because I think there is an is an answer to it. But I want to I think I'm interested in this kind of like various levels on of misreading um, that so it wouldn't it would it be better if they had killed a real Muslim, right? Of course not. So you know, so this is not so it's not to, to about the question who's who's real and how. So the construction of, of realness is a problem in this in the thing. But maybe I have to be more specific and to think more about this and to to go more into this and to not only like ask the questions but to offer some some kind of theoretization of well, the. Well, because you're also saying. Have an answer about you. Maybe you partly do, which is that part of the difference is the difference is the difference between what it's like to have violence visited on you, homophobia or Islamophobia, and what it's like to ex and how you experience it. Maybe one of the differences is the interface between the violence and the, I don't know, but that's how you described it. Was it's different if you have straight privileges and you're misread as a lesbian? Perhaps there's no difference in the reading, but there might be a difference in the experience of the reading. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, how the second part is interconnected to the first part, I think this is come, comes out of my own trajectory in my research. So I started to, to do the research because I, I was basically annoyed by these kind of critical migration studies approaches that equated racism and migratism at the same all the time, so I came up with the migratism concept. And basically, what like when I take myself <coughs> as an example, what I said is um, like alongside with many other things is to say I am constructed as migrant in Western Europe, but I'm not constructed as non-white. So this is uh, so this is migratism and not not racism. And then I wanted to twist this thing and wanted. To to ask the question, so what happens? So, so you have on the one hand, you have a statement, and Sarah Ahmed help, helps us to think about this. Statements of whiteness are not automatically um, anti-racist, right? And so, what part of what I did was to say, oh wait a minute, we have we need a distinction here because I know we need the, the distinction because from my own positionality, because I'm privileged as white and um, I'm described with migration. So this was in a way a statement of whiteness. And so I wanted to move on from that and wanted to look at how to blur that and how to complicate it and how to say like, okay, so, but we don't know, so there is no essence behind it and no category that we can rely on. So basically the category of white Romanians is a category that how can we talk about white Romanians? So how can we know that they are white? So how can, so this was, this is the interconnection that I wanted to complicate this. 
Is, it, is this clear? Yeah. The underscore, the underscore, this might be a problem of, so sometimes I, this is a problem of, who was the underscore person? <laughs> Thanks. Um, the, this is a problem of translation, because uh, I've done a lot of my research in, in German language, and there I work a lot with underscores, because you have like a lot of problems that comes with the German language. So for example, you have like, Female forms and male forms for like so we have the migrant so, so we have the migrant always in the gendered form so you cannot have the word migrant without having a gendering in it so you would use the underscore to um, say that there is a gap so rather so the feminist trajectory of this is saying then migrant in the female form and use this as the generic form instead of the male form and then you have the problem of course this is problematic too and and so on so you have um, like so you can use the underscore to blur this kind of gendering that comes in the terms and then I expanded this and used it for trying to make clear that there that for that when I want to combine different concepts but language linear language does only allow me to have them like first one and then the other then I would like interconnect it with the underscore to say, oh, I want to com combine the concept and I don't want to talk about it differently, but linear language does not allow me to do that, so I use the underscore. And I think this is, I took it mostly out from, from my publications and so on because people get confused and this is like, I, I sometimes had publications, for example, use a lot of underscores, so people talk only about the underscores and not about the actual content. <laughs> so I have the feeling, oh, maybe maybe I just give up the underscores and try to say it in a different way. Um, so this is like some, some something from the past. <laughs> um, <coughs> what was this? It was Aliha. But what did you say? What is this word? <laughs> so the, the last thing was about privilege. Maybe we have to talk about this after because I didn't. I'm not really sure if I got all of the point. I have somehow an idea. So what was your first? Um, that the thing that you offer is very useful. I can see it like working in a south south context. Yes. Oh yes. Yeah, thank you. That, that's what people often ask me, and then I say, oh, I don't work on this, I don't know, you have to tell me. So thank you, great, cool. And I, I had hoped that it would work, and I had some kind of ideas from literature that I thought, oh, this might work. So yes, cool. Great, well, thank you very much, Agasha, and thank you all for your questions. And questions.